And we're coming back. All right. Let's go to this one. There we go. Cool. I'm back. Uh, it's really weird because this room looks so much better mirrored, but it annoys the hell out of me that all my text is backwards. <laughs> but that's okay. I don't know why I put those back up. Yeah. All right. How are we doing? Okay, so now we're going to dive into the elements of story. Now that I spent an hour talking about writing and really saying nothing, um, as with all good debates. So there are five main elements of, to, of a story. Um, four of those are pretty much uh, no contest. Everyone agrees those are the four. Uh, the fifth one gets debated a lot, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I went with the one that I've always I've always been taught was was the fifth one, and a lot of people agree that it is the fifth one, uh, but it is still a matter of debate. Um, and yeah, you know, new haircut, went to my other pair of glasses, cool new shirt. Had to had to do a thing, you know, had to do a thing. Uh, so yeah, um, I've written out like a whole section, it's like two pages just for these five things and then like a whole other thing on like the potential fifth one. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to go through all of it. Hopefully I will. Uh, if not, we'll continue next week, but, uh, I think I'll be okay. Uh, the one thing I did want to say about that is there are a lot of smaller ideas within the five concepts uh, that I won't be explaining today, uh, which is unfortunate because I wanted to, but I, I really don't think I'm going to have time. Uh, but that's fine because those are going to make up the basis of other sh episodes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I've already done half my planning for the next six episodes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I can just pull them out and, and plug them in. Um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll list them off and then I'll, I'll explain them a little bit broader. Uh, so the five elements of story or storytelling are character, setting, conflict, Plot and theme. So I'll repeat those. Character, setting, conflict, plot, and theme. And let's be honest, all my episodes are shenanigans. Just saying. Just saying. Um, so, what is a character? Chat, what is a character? Tell me what a character is. Oh, right, I, I, I forgot to point it out. Uh, so the lovely Johnny who was in chat uh, told me in episode one that I should totally make a t-shirt with stuff I said on it. Um, so, logo. And you can't read that. Good, good job, Bureau, good job. Go back to this one. How's that, Johnny? I totally forgot that I was going to shout out that. So there you go. Shout it out. Yeah, deal, Sam, deal. I know, but whatever. It was a, it was a trial run. It was a trial run. So, yeah. It is, it is so hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's so hot. 
Uh, so what is a character? Chat, tell me what a character is. And not Sam. Sam's not a character. Unless I make him a character. But he's not right now. Come on, chat. You can do it. Oh, I forgot about the other thing. To show off the other cool thing. One sec. cards for the channel uh, they have a logo on the back and then they have um, uh, stupid mirroring they have like the channel and just like a little detail and then like, put the website and stuff and, and my name so yeah we give out these to random people um, super love these they're awesome And very useful marketing tool, by the way. So, I finally got someone answering my question. What is a character? Uh, Johnny says, character, a human or non-human being that shows features that make them unique and special. Kind of. Uh, it's, it's actually way more general than that. Um, I'm not going to change it again. It's fine. Uh, so it's a, a, a character is a person, animal, or thing who takes part in the action of a short story or other literary work. So they don't need to be unique or special. I mean, not all characters are unique or special. Uh, and the reason for that is because you're thinking of a protagonist or an antagonist. Uh, there are also romantic interests, supporting characters, minor characters, uh, throwaway characters. There's lots of other uh, there's lots of types of characters and not all of them are special. Like a waiter, it, like a waiter can be special, but when your two, when your two main characters are sitting down on their date, the waiter doesn't really matter unless he causes some, something to happen in the dramatic event, in the plot. Um, but yeah, um, they don't have to be unique or special. Uh, they're basically just someone who's there. And the reason I break it down into animal or thing as well um, is because of things like Chekhov's gun. Um, being Anton Chekhov, the, the famous Russian short, short story writer, uh, Chekhov's gun uh, being a uh, something that was mentioned earlier on that you know is going to be important later. Um, and, and those things can be characters. Um, I think of the Dukes of Hazard. Um, that car is like a character. Even, even though it doesn't speak or interact in those ways, it's, it, it's a character. It's part of their, their show and, and their relationships and, and everything. Like that's totally a thing. Um, right. And then, you know, you have animals. I watched Zootopia last night. Uh, every character's an animal. I mean, they're, they're personified. They have human-like traits. But they're all animals. And uh, Robin is correct. Never introduce a gun. If you're not going to use it, people will be pissed. They will. That being said, 
if you use the gun to distract somebody else from something else, that counts as a correct use. Just saying. So yeah. I also watched The Hateful Eight last night, or the rest of it. Fantastic film. I went out, I bought the screenplay today. Uh, they had it all in the bookstore. I was like, oh yes, because it's the actual screenplay, it's not the shooting script. Uh, I don't know if anyone else here like buys screenplays in general, but uh, most of the time there's a shooting script, and that's cool, but the shooting script tends to be almost exactly what's filmed on the page. It's much, it's much more interesting to see the, the, the original script uh, and where they made changes. Um, so yeah, totally. M much cooler to read the original script. That being said, Quentin Tarantino writes and directs his own movies. Uh, and writer-directors tend to be a little better about things like that. Uh, they don't need a shooting script uh, because they have a vision of it in their head and they don't, like it. it's fine. Um, the other issue with shooting scripts is shooting scripts tend to have a lot of camera details in in them, and uh, that's a that's a huge faux pas in in screenwriting. Um, like that's a huge faux pas uh, because the that's the director's job, um, right? Uh, so it doesn't really give you a good idea what a real screenplay is supposed to look like. Um, and it kind of ruins the flow of the original writing. Uh, that being said, again, weird example is Quentin Tarantino, because he's a writer-director, puts camera things in his script. Not a ton, but he includes specific types of shots that he wants. And that's perfectly acceptable. Um, because he's established and because he's directing his own films and all that. Uh, and, and you can do it to a certain extent where it's applicable. Like if you need a certain close up or something in order to dramatically tell something, uh, it can be done. But in general, yeah, super great film. I really liked it. Uh, I, I do kind of have a problem with Tarantino's dialogue because it feels very manufactured to me, which sucks. Uh, but at the same time, it has so many great moments of just cool circularity and, and reference and stuff that, that makes it, that make it worthwhile. Uh, but his, his cinematographer, uh, in that film is, is astoundingly good. Uh, there's so many great framing shots and there's this awesome, I don't know if that anyone else knows it, but there's this, there's like wooden tables and there's a couple of them in the film. And every time a character is sitting down in one, there's like a golden halo shining down on the table. And I love it. Uh, the first time you kind of see it is actually when uh, one of the characters is reading a letter, and it, it's so good because like it's almost like shining on this letter. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, back to the five elements of story. Chat derails me yet again. Um, so I I actually came up with a whole series of examples for for talking about these things. Um, so I'm going to go back to this screen. And, and I prepared most of them. The ones that are, are very visual, I, I prepared. Uh, so, uh, the first one here. Look at this. The Oscars. Yay! I don't like the Oscars. But, you know, that's the thing. It's just because it's kind of like an old boys club. Um, but we won't, we, won't, we won't get into that. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here was kind of a lot of what I was saying that there's different types of characters, right? I mean, the Oscars literally break it up in saying these are lead characters, these are supporting characters. Uh, and, and the distinction can get weird uh, sometimes, for sure. Um, but in general, yeah, like, this is, this is a straight-up breakup, you know? Leonardo DiCaprio was the lead character in The Revenant. You know, he's the, he was the protagonist. Um, often the antagonist is, is a supporting actor. Uh, it depends how much they appear in the film. Um, and again, it's one of those weird, like, loosey-goosey rules. Um, 
Well, yeah. <laughs> I I want to do the reaction. I like doing it live. Uh, my perfectionism streak would ruin me on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I would I would totally like. Um, I would totally spend hours upon hours trying to get shots and, and, and words and retakes and stuff and it would it would be awful. It would ruin me. It would ruin me. Uh, but yeah. So this is a great example of what I was talking about of different types of characters. Um, you know, actors in lead role, actors in supporting role. Uh, they're distinct, they're different. So the second one, the second one is setting. So what is a setting? A setting is a time and a place in which a story happens. Time and place in which a story happens. Um, setting matters. Where you set something changes everything. It changes how your characters talk, changes their motivations. It changes how people perceive their motivations. It changes the technology they have access to. It changes the building aesthetics. It changes the clothing aesthetics. It changes their. It changes haircuts. It changes everything. Um, setting. You know, it, it, it's about world building. It's about it's about creating a milieu for a story. Um, and, and as someone who deals a lot in genre fiction, setting is super important. Um, I mean, setting is almost literally the whole thing of like Lord of the Rings or high fantasy. Uh, and not almost literally, like it, it is. It's the thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and setting is super difficult it really is it's so easy to ignore uh, in favor of, of so many other things um, yeah uh, and that's super interesting Sam uh, about uh, there's an article in Analog about how ridiculous it is that people ask what's your story about and I agree um, the funny, you, you know what, you know what, you know what's even more interesting to me about that, that, that question is they ask, what's your story about? And they mean, what is the plot? But arguably, funnily enough, we, uh, right now, or at least because of Hollywood in the last, last hundred years or so, we really like character driven stories. So they ask, what's their story about? Looking for a plot, but really it's how good the character is that makes it interesting within the world that they're given because your character is really defined by your set. So it does go back to world building, but it's, it's really one of those things, right? Like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. And we're going to come back to that when we get to theme. Um, challenge my thinking, see Ready Player One. That's by uh, Cory Doctorow, right? I haven't read that. I've been meaning to read it for a long time. Oh yeah, and that was the other thing I wanted to approach. Um, I, I wanted to, I want to impart this idea uh, on my audience that this show is about writing, but it's not just for writers. It's for people who are interested in writing. It's for people who work in those other narrative fields. I want to impart ideas like backstory, like setting, like character, and, and how those and how those things uh, help inform things like art. Um, I really, yeah, I gotta read Red Shirts, that, that is true. Red Shirts sounds fantastically 
amazing. Um, like, uh, my friend, uh, John Derek Murphy, Twitch streamer John Derek Murphy, um, and let's see if this works. I think this works. I might have to set this up. Nope, doesn't work. Okay, never mind. Uh, but my good friend John Derek Murphy, I was, I was... Um, I was breaking down sort of uh, a series of tests he did for Games Workshop in which I analyzed the narrative content of his images. Um, and I think narrative is super important when it comes to illustration. Uh, not necessarily concept art, but just in general. Where... You know, uh, these characters didn't appear out of nowhere. They don't. They didn't just suddenly spring into existence. They have something that formed them, and and that's setting really. Um, you know, and, and how you make those decisions in your art and in your writing, like your visual art or your writing, will influence how your character appears on the page. Um, I have I have examples. Um, I opened up a bunch of stuff here. I don't know what this is. This is an environment. You have a culture. Um, they're obviously uh, native influenced. Uh, they look a little bit more uh, Inuit to me than than Native American. Um, there's a little like influx of snow and like the way that they're dressed. But this. These characters have a story. We don't know what the story is because it's an image, but they, they have a story. There's a reason they're there. There's a reason that they are who they are. Um, there's a reason that their world has developed the way it has. Right? Knowing how your character exists, how he came to be, and we're going to do a lot more in-depth stuff with characters, but um, in a later episode, probably two or three episodes from now. Um, but how, like, how you construct this image based on, on those backstories and those ideas will change your image. You know? I, and, and I and I hang out with a lot of artists, and I've seen them where they're like, oh, this just looks cool, let's put it in. And it's just like, well, no. Why is that there? How does it change their character? What makes them interesting? Uh, I've seen Jonah Loeb, uh, who's a really cool uh, artist and modeler uh, here on Twitch as well, um, who, who did work for Skyrim and stuff like that, where he talks about uh, how to give your your character's personality um and that's exactly what i'm talking about that personality is not born out of any out of nowhere there's a story that gave him that personality and you don't have to write that story down but it is something that you can explore in order to cr create better images um I, and and this was the example i designed or i came up with for a setting was was concept art i mean this is what concept art does it's supposed to give you ideas of what a place is like and give you variations and, and, and make informed decisions about why those things are there. So I have like this, this hover bike. This is really cool. You got some, some different drawings about how the, the engine could work. Or uh, the, thing, uh, the, the dock module uh, that, that's there. You got VTOLs, different types of VTOLs from different countries. Um, why are they different? Why is this one, why is this, this top one really sleek? Why is this one really fat? Like, there's, there's informed decisions there. Um, I got air cars. Right? And different variants and perspectives on air cars to show a design. Um, and I'm, I just found this guy today and I think he's really cool. Uh, Dimitri Popov. Uh, a lot of really cool concept art. But yeah, um, 
a society that has these air cars is going to be different than a society that has regular cars. Not necessarily noticeable differences on the surface, but there are going to be differences. And how those characters interact with those things changes that. So yeah. Um, just catching up on chat here, because obviously I just ignore chat all the time. Um, I've not seen the Deus Ex trailer. Uh, I expect it's cool. Uh, I'm a big fan of Miyazaki, though Miyazaki is super interesting because all of his works are adaptations, or most of them. Um, which no one really th talks about ever. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. Oh, cool. Uh, link that to me, Sam, and I'll check it out later. Uh, for sure. For sure. Um, I do really gotta read Peter Watts. Uh, I know you recommended him to me all the time, and I never have gotten around to it. I will get there eventually. I promise. I promise. I'm not gonna do it. I, I promise. <laughs> no, I will. I will. Um, so, yeah. Jeez, it's already been half an hour? Man, time flies, time flies. Uh, so the third element is plot. So a plot is a series of events and character actions that relate to the central conflict. Plots are super interesting. Uh, plots are, are generally the framework of, our, of a story. Um, there's a lot of other things. There's subplots. Uh, you know, other plots that interweave with the main plot, uh, which tends to be things like the romantic interest, uh, the buddy character, uh, certain things like that. Uh, plot points, turning points, things that cause the characters to change in their dramatic need. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about dramatic needs and stuff like that uh, next week uh, when I get to outlining. Um, but yeah. There's a, there's a lot to, to that. And uh, for this example, I don't have a visual example, unfortunately. Um, but uh, there are... Um, well, the example I, I, I thought of, because I've kind of picked a different... A different... Uh, a different uh, discipline for each, for each category. Uh, so this one is drama. Uh, I think of Shakespearean plays with a five-act plot structure where uh, your climax is always in Act 3 uh, and your resolution is in Act 5 and, and there's like things in between and they're set up very similarly across all of his plays. Um, that's the five-act plot structure and uh, Aristotle talks about three-act and five-act plot, plot structures. Um, so yeah. And I realize that not every single one of his of Miyazaki's movies is an adaptation. Uh, that was a hyperbole. I apologize. Uh, hyperbole being a gross exaggeration. Um, but there are quite a few of his more well-known ones, uh, which are adaptations. The answer, uh, yes, On Top of Poppy Hill is an adaptation, so is Grave of the Firefly, so is Howl's Moving Castle, uh, Arietta and the, whatever that one was called, is an adaptation, uh, they did the Dragon Sea movie, or, sorry, not Dragon Sea, uh, the Ursula Le Guin book, Earthsea, Earthsea, that's the one. No, no, uh, those, those movies, all the ones I just named, are actually based on books. Uh, they're based on, on physical books. Uh, and most of them are not Japanese, funnily enough. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, fine, it's Ghibli. I apologize. It was Ghibli. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, it's it's Arietti. <laughs> My bad. My bad. <laughs> which is based on the Borrowers, uh, which is a very famous famous book. Yeah, well, if Earthsea is his son, he's still a Miyazaki. Still correct. Just saying. Uh, so the fourth element is conflict. Conflict is arguably the most important element. Uh, Sidfield square swears by conflict. Uh, which I well, I'll talk about when I get to the book club. But um, a conflict is a struggle between two people or things. Um, at, at a minimum, it's not necessarily just two people or two things, but at a minimum. So, conflict. Conflicts. Um, there are there are basically uh, two types of conflict. There's external conflict and internal conflict. Uh, internal conflict is really only uh, shown in one form, and it's uh, man versus self, uh, because self encompasses all that is you. Um, and uh, the uh, external conflicts are like. Uh, man versus man, uh, you versus another person, uh, man versus society, you versus your society trying to change things, man versus nature, uh, all those like cool movies where people go out into the middle of nowhere and try to survive, uh, or disaster films, uh, you know, man versus nature. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other stuff. Um, no, those are the main three. Uh, those are the main three. And, and, and you can define most conflict by those four things I just named. Uh, obviously, they, they get more specific as you go, but conflict is what drives the plot of a story. Uh, how events happen through the conflict and characters' actions as reactions to the conflict in the story. If you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. Um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily like a bad guy punching thing. Like, and I know that's all, like people say conflict. Oh, it's an argument. It's a fight. Not necessarily. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of this influences, uh, character relationships, relationships with the setting. Um, their dramatic wants, their dramatic needs. Um, there's so much to how the conflict uh, influences everything, right? And, and a good conflict, like you, if you have a bad conflict, people are gonna point it out. They're gonna notice real, really early. Um, and, and it's it's. It's kind of easy to spot, <laughs> uh, and it'll make your story weaker overall. So always, yeah, have a good conflict. Um, it's what's going to drive everything your character does uh, for the entirety of the story, and it's going to drive the plot and and all those things. So, yeah, conflict, conflict, like the conflict happening in my chat right now. Yeah. Uh, so the example for this one. I have here, boom, Dungeons and Dragons, yay, because I'm a nerd. Um, Role-playing games are a great example of conflict-driven storytelling, because it's literally, like, well, I mean, we're going to use a very stereotypical traditional example here, but it's literally, I have a quest, I got to kill things in a dungeon get the treasure and get back out sort of thing. 
like, that's literal conflict. Like, we're going to fight the entire way through. But then there are other, other types of role-playing games, like Fiasco, like Microscope, where you build relationships between characters and how those characters interact, and it changes how the plot of the story, of the story within your group goes. Um, and in one of my experiment streams, or sorry, not in one of my experiment streams, uh, on my birthday stream, uh, which will be in July, uh, I'm going to do some live role-playing with some of my friends uh, on stream, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about storytelling in terms of in terms of role playing, and in terms of uh, character relationships and, and uh, interactions and stuff like that. It's, it should be good. It should be good. I think I have enough friends that I can do two groups. So I might do like like a few hours with one and a few hours with another. We'll see how it goes. I'm still planning that guy, but um, yeah. Uh, Eclipse Phase, fantastic role-playing game, crazy transhumanism, transhumanism is a fin fascinating concept, uh, so yeah, uh, that's, that's totally a thing, um, uh, Hero Quest is cool, uh, <laughs> is, is that a picture of Hero Quest? I didn't know, I don't know, it said Dungeons and Dragons on it, I just assumed it was Dungeons and Dragons. But yeah, I mean, role-playing, great, like, role-playing is all about conflict and how characters interact. That's why it's role-play. Um, so yeah. Then the last one, uh, theme. Theme is the central idea or belief in a story. It's kind of what the story is about. Um, which is why when, when Sam was talking about that article in Analog, it's kind of funny because people always ask what's the story about and, and it's always like, oh, it's about life and death and art, blah, blah, blah. But they don't really care about that. They want the other things. <laughs> they want the other things. Um, but yeah. Uh, theme is important. Uh, theme is what I was kind of struggling with with my last short story because uh, it didn't have a purpose uh, it, other than, than me thinking I'm clever which is not a good purpose at all uh, for telling a story um, so yeah um, themes are actually a big part of what make up music uh, especially cinematic music but just um especially cinematic music, but mostly uh, opera. Um, and I totally should have brought up opera pictures. That should have happened. Ah. So we're going to pull out one up here. Yes. Das Rheingold. Wagner. I love Wagner. Wagner's a cool guy. Boom. Opera. That's a horrible television thing from one of the things. I'm dying from the heat, man. It's crazy. Crazy. Um, I'll, I'll introduce people after the stream. Don't worry. So, uh, yeah, uh, Opera is super big for, for, for thematic things. Um, La Boheme uh, is one of the most famous operas uh, in recent times, particularly because it's the inspiration for Rent, uh, the musical, the movie, the phenomenon. Um, yeah, yeah, make fun of my German accent. It's fine. It's fine. I said it's fine. Um, so, opera is super interesting, especially Wagnerian opera, because he is super good at using themes and motifs um, as part of uh, as part of the the staging of the opera. Um, he uses them like every time an item is mentioned, there's a motif. Every time a character enters a scene, 
there's a theme. Um, he he uses them to tell his stories really really well, and that's that's exactly the same as how we're gonna use theme. Um, it's it's an idea. Um, to 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 give us some sort of meaning, to give us a uh, not necessarily a lesson, but for us to take something away from a story. Um, and themes tend to be very broad about very broad things, but they can be very specific. Um, if you remember me talking about it last week, or was it the week before? Last week, I think. Oh well, obviously it was the week before, but I meant last episode. Um, where creating creating a story based on a theme can be kind of weak, and it can because you tend to, you tend to end up very preachy. But the best way to approach theme is to set up your conflicts, set up your characters, and your themes will 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 fill out regardless it's good to know your themes because then you can you can tweak things in order to 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 play with those themes but you can build the themes afterwards they'll build out of your your in your complex they'll build out of your characters and the way they deal with things um so yeah theme uh so the last kind of concept and kind of the, oh, well, I guess I'll mention it. The other, like, th the other main, uh, the other contender for the fifth spot in the five elements of story is uh, mostly resolution, uh, which I don't really like because resolutions are very important but they're part of plot and conflict. They're not, it's not really a separate thing in my opinion. That being said, resolutions are super important to plotting and outlining. Uh, so I will be talking about resolution a lot more next week, um, for sure. So the last thing I wanna talk about is point of view and narration. Um, yeah, so uh, often uh, often abbreviated as POV, uh, point of view, uh, it is used in a lot of different ways, but we're specifically going to talk about it in terms of narrative voice, uh, literary point of view, narrative point of view. Um, so, what, what does that mean, Brendan? What, what is a narrative point of view? Well, basically... It's, it's the types of language we're using to tell the story. It, 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 it gives us a sort of metric for what the way that the author is going to interact with the reader. Uh, so there's three main types of point of view, uh, though most people split it up into four because the third one is really two main things, um, but three main types. So the first one, well, so there's first person, second person, and third person. Uh, third person tends to be broken up into limited and omniscient. Um, and I'll break those down in, in a few minutes because uh, I have 15 minutes to get through this section or so. Uh, probably more like 10, but 15 minutes. Uh, so a first person narrative is told from the perspective of a character in the story. Uh, you use the forms I and we um, to tell it. it it's, it's a way of conveying uh, internal thoughts very well. Uh, so it works well in those kinds of stories that have a lot of internal things. Um, it feels very natural for that. Uh, second person is really weird. Uh, second person is one is the least used form uh, by four, and there's actually two versions of second person. Uh, there's second person 
uh, that's used in a couple of different authors who I haven't read, so I can't really speak about them. Uh, but it's very alienating using that kind of second person. The other version of second person is the one that's used in uh, Choose Your Own Adventure and Find Fantasy books. I'm a huge fan of Steve Jackson, uh, the way he designed games. Uh, but yeah, uh, Steve Jackson, uh, Fighting Fantasy, they use you because they're sort of interacting with the reader in terms of, uh, it's like, you're doing this, you're doing that. Our group is doing this. It, it's, it's a way of interacting with the reader. Uh, fan fiction does it a lot. Uh, there's a lot, a ton of fanfics that I never read because I don't, I don't like it. I don't like self-insertion in that way. Uh, I like self-insertion in other ways. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm talking about Mary Sue's. But, um, yeah. Um, they, they, it's a way of making the reader part of the story with that kind of you. The other kind of you is really weird because the way that I understand it as it was used, uh, it's kind of used in this weird way of being like a character is talking to himself in the second person. And, and, and it's messed up. Yeah, well, see, yeah, I mean, second person is the hardest one and it's really dumb. Uh, and almost never used. Uh, I'll find an example real quick. Um, cause I should have a thing open. No, I don't. I do not. I will do it like that. Okay. Yeah, so. We're highlight here. Second person narrative. Um, prominent example, yeah, yeah, I know. It's just because it's hard. It's hard to describe second person. It just, it's just, it's really weird. Um, so in the novel Bright Likes Big City by, uh, Jay McErnie, uh, the second person narrator is observing his own out-of-control life, and able to cope with the trauma he keeps hidden from readers for most of the book, Death of His Mother's. And he talks to himself in the second person. Uh, so he uses you. You are not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this this time in the morning. But here you are, and you cannot say the terrain is entirely unfamiliar, although the details are fuzzy. He's talking to himself. And I, and I understand how that could easily be alienated. So... I don't know. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm, sh I'm sure it's a cool concept. It's not really my thing. It's not really my thing. Uh, though I do have some cool ideas uh, when we get to kind of the end of this, this topic. Um, so we'll skip over second person for now. Don't do it. It's easier just not to do it. <laughs> Trust me. Um, third person. Third person is, um, is someone outside of the story, uh, though it can be some, it's usually someone outside the story, but can be someone inside the story, uh, and they refer to the characters as he, she, or it, or, and they. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's like, it's the, it's the traditional most used style. Uh, Harry went to the store. He bought a bag of groceries. He came home. See? Harry, he, he. I'm referring to the character. Um, it can be someone in the story. Uh, the most famous example... Uh, no, wait. I'm wrong. That's first person. Never mind. Never mind. It can be someone in the story. Uh, the easiest way to do someone in the story, uh, in third person, is through third person limited. Uh, it's called limited because uh, we generally only see the internals of one character versus omniscient, which you see the internals of all the characters. 
most writers consider omniscient to be bad form because it, it's way too confusing to the reader to keep track of thoughts. Um, that's not to say it can't be done, and it's certainly easier than second person, uh, but it is hard. It's hard to do well. Um, so yeah. That, that's the whole thing. Um, the, uh, there was a thing. What was the thing? I was thinking of a thing. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, there's kind of this other inflection of third person where it's third person subjective and third person objective. Uh, they have a lot of similarities to, um, omniscient versus limited but they aren't exactly the same uh, subjective tends to be things that are colored towards the character um, versus objective which are like very very neutral like well here's the example uh, in a lot of ways this is how the author interacts with the reader right uh, so in my example of Harry went to the store um, Excuse me, frog in my throat. Uh, Harry went to the store. Uh, that's a very objective statement. He went to the store. It's neutral. There's nothing. But I could easily change that as the narrator and say something like, slovenly Harry went to the store. That's a whole different thing. And while that can be objective, it's really not. It's, it's kind of subjective. I'm, I'm creating a character aspect of him being sloven, a sloth, uh, lazy, right? So those are different ways that you can approach third person. Um, there are, there is a precedent for hybrids. Uh, and this is what I was talking about when I was talking about cool ideas. I'm really intrigued by a hybrid, like first, second person, book um and hybrids can be really neat um i've seen a few where like they'll do third person for the main parts of the story but then when it flips to certain characters it'll be in uh first person uh to give you like internal perspective on those characters um there's a few that do it like they have like one first person chapter in the entire book um which can be weird uh, like can be jarring but at the same time if it really communicates what you're trying to get across in that scene uh can be very effective um that is blindsight i gotta read blindsight then i've been meaning to read it forever uh but yeah like i'm, I'm intrigued by ideas of, of like mixing persons uh <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it after sam we will we will um, so yeah, uh, there are hybrids and you can do interesting things with that. Uh, so yeah, cool. It's, uh, it's five to nine. Uh, so I'm going to take a five minute break and then I'm going to come back and do like kind of the close up of the show. Um, if, uh, yeah, we'll do a close up. We'll have Q and A. So write your questions. Uh, if you want me to re-explain second person, I will. I'll try my best. It's difficult. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to go to a break. All right.